Okay, well, thanks, Sally, and thanks for all coming out. So, um, so I want to talk about about three themes very briefly, each of them. Uh, the first is um, the global financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis that's uh, engulfed at least uh, the northern hemisphere capitalist economies for nearly 10 years now. Uh, the second is the European project and uh, the implications of the, of the current crisis. And the third is um, the implications for, for, uh, for the left, for uh, social democrats and socialists arising from uh, events in Greece but in a bunch of other countries also. So beginning, what we've had, uh, what we've experienced uh, for most of the decade since the mid-1970s uh, is uh, a form of capitalism increasingly dominated by the financial sector by massively increased uh, flows of uh, financial capital unrelated, broadly speaking, to any, um, uh, to any of the traditional functions of finance, to financing investment in new capital projects, uh, to uh, recirculating savings and so forth. Uh, volumes of speculation and speculative lending that uh, massively exceed any sort of real economic activity. Uh, and this, um, this took um, uh, some related and complicated forms in a, in a sort of triangular rate relationship between uh, uh, Europe and, uh, and uh, the United States in the early years of this century, partly driven by the rise of the euro. I'll, I'll take some questions on this if I need to, but uh, it's pot, but, and also driven by, I uh, believe, more driven by financial deregulation, which uh, allowed massive profits to be made by um, firms, uh, financial firms willing to take on risk, uh, and the, uh, there were still regulatory constraints in place, uh, and ways, there were two large, two large scale ways of getting rid of this risk. One was the so-called derivatives, which drove the uh, real estate boom in the United States, and the other was arose from the creation of the euro, which instantly made all the European sovereign states uh, regarded as as A great as AAA equally good borrowers. Uh, now, uh, and those two things interacted. Uh, when the crisis came, what we what we saw was a, a crash, a real estate and financial crash uh, in both uh, North America and Europe, uh, and a large number of governments, most of them. Uh, until that point, having been regarded as very financially responsible, running into massive financial difficulty, uh, not because in general of, of public profligacy, but because they had to bail out overextended financial systems. Now, Greece, uh, which I'll come to in a moment, was in fact something of an exception to this. The, the Greek governments actually were guilty of the profligate borrowing that has been, um, has been laid at the door of the Irish, Spanish and so forth, whose primary sin was simply to believe the finance guys when they said they were, they were building sustainable prosperity for everybody. Uh, but so what we had in response to this was so-called austerity, that is, uh, the blame was put entirely in the public sector and, and whereas, of course, the money had been made uh, in the city of London and, um, and in, in New York, those people were rescued, uh, school teachers and firefighters and, uh, and the unemployed were made to, pay the, made to pay the price, on the theory that we would see a resurgence of private sector economic activity which would rapidly bring things back into play. Now that's failed everywhere but no more, nowhere more drastically than in Greece where our GDP is something like 25% below its pre-crisis level. But uh, throughout the EU and US, uh, the level of economic activity is still far below what would have been expected uh, if we had a normal recession and recovery. Uh, so, so this policy of austerity has been pursued almost everywhere with disastrous consequences. I should mention that uh, Australia is one of the few countries which adopted a large enough fiscal stimulus in the first place that we in fact managed to avoid, uh, avoid the worst consequences of this, even though deficit mania took, took hold a relatively short period afterwards. Uh, it's, ne it's always been in Australia more on the level of rhetoric than on the level of actual willingness to do uh, the suicidal things that have been done in nearly every other, every other developed economy. So, so we're now in this general situation though where uh, uh, the policies both where we've seen uh, the failure both of the promise of financialised capitalism that was going to make us all, all rich. You know, if you read anything from the 1990s, I mean, Thomas Friedman would be your uh, vulgarised version, uh, this endless prosperity that was going to arise out of a massively expanded uh, financial speculation. Uh, that, of course, hasn't happened. Austerity is a failure. But the hopes that people like me certainly had that this would lead to a resurgence of the left clearly hasn't been... Um, uh, hasn't in general been realised. So we're you know, uh, uh, looking ahead. We're in a situation where 
there's no longer any significant level of positive appeal, I think, for the free market capitalist message, but, but uh, uh, the left has collectively failed to articulate an alternative. Now, as I say, the situation in Europe was significantly influenced by the creation of the euro, which um, and by, uh, which was uh, one of, uh, reflected one of two contrasting themes in the whole European project. So, broadly speaking, of course, it, the project arises out of World War II and the determination that, that this kind of economic warfare shouldn't happen again, and it had both a fairly progressive component of Europe as, as the social democratic model and alternative to the US, but also a very strong neoliberal component uh, of uh, competition policy, of market-oriented reform and so forth. And that was exemplified, that was at its peak at, at, in the late 1990s when the Euro and the European Central Bank were created. And so it is that the institutions which have driven the response to the crisis represent the worst aspects of the European project and have been a disastrous failure. The, um, uh, they've gradually, to some extent, you know, the European Central Bank uh, under Trichet they, was a total disaster. The, uh, the, it's been subsequently gradually dragged somewhere marginally close to reality, but still determined to make, still, well, really, in fact, uh, as you can see from the politics, still determined not to admit the disaster which would be admitted if having forced the Spanish, Portuguese, Italians and Irish to accept massive losses in order to bail out the banks, if they then let the Greeks off, uh, then, uh, then it's a disaster for the prestige of the central institutions of the European project. Uh, but they are now in a very difficult position in the sense that uh, they have to not only, um, not only of course not let the, uh, not let the Greeks off uh, lightly, uh, but also the even worse outcome would be uh, a successful default and exit from the euro on the, part of, on the part of Greece. Now, no one knows whether that can happen or not, but uh, should Greece uh, default in its debt, uh, undergo, say, another year of recession, but then recover in the way that, for example, Argentina did when they defaulted, uh, the um, prestige of the central European institutions uh, would be utterly destroyed. So, uh, uh, so they're in the position where uh, Although, of course, they're not willing to admit it, perhaps even to themselves, uh, they have to ensure that uh, should they push the Greeks over, over the limit, that they also destroy their economy once and for all, uh, because uh, uh, the worst possible outcome for the, uh, for the ECB and European Commission would be a successful, a successful default. Uh, so, um, that's, so finally, uh, uh, a little bit about the, um, I'll talk, you can give somewhat more details about that process, but I think the answer, as with all such negotiations, is there's a great deal of kabuki type posturing. No one really knows uh, what, yeah, no one really knows, for example, whether Soriza in the end will be willing to default, under what conditions. Uh, no one really knows whether, uh, whether the ECB, the European Central Bank, is in fact willing to contemplate the destruction of the currency it was created to. Um, had to merge. I should mention the other threat to the European project, of course, is, is Britain, uh, coming from the other side. They're, they're pressed from the possibility of a, of a, of a British exit or, or, an, or the, an attempt in the avoid, to avoid it by some sort of forced renegotiation of British terms. And um, so, so the whole project, I think, having taken this disastrous neoliberal turn, is, is in grave difficulty, which I don't think is, is uh, realised by its managers. Coming to the uh, the, the situation of the left. So, so I'll, I'll briefly describe, and I uh, hasten to add I'm not a, in any way an expert on Greek politics, but uh, broadly speaking, of course, there was a military dictatorship there. Um, uh, uh, probably all seen films like Z and things like that in the, um, uh, looking at the coup in the 1970s. Emerging from that was a two-party duopoly, the so-called New, New Democratic Party, which was essentially uh, not quite the continuation of the generals, but the, um, uh, but the right and pass up the um, Socialist Party. Now, uh, uh, of course, nominally socialist, but at least through the 1980s, yeah, reasonably, uh, reasonably clearly a left social democratic party, which like most social democratic parties, um, uh, became saturated with the ideas of market reform, largely, largely went along with those ideas. And um, uh, in the end proved incapable, even though it was uh, very much the less responsible of the two parties for the disasters of the um, uh, disastrous borrowing. New democracy was clearly the worst. Uh, they found themselves unable to uh, unable to resist uh, the cause for austerity. Went into coalition with New Democracy, and this has been pretty much the pattern of most of the European Central Demo Social Democratic parties, with varying consequences. But uh, 
utterly disastrous in the case of PASOK. So from being one of the two major parties, it's been essentially wiped out of existence um, as a result of its, its um, essentially collaboration with austerity, and uh, its place has been taken by Syriza, which is an amalgam of a variety of social movements, left political parties and so forth. Um, because it's amalgam, it's hard to say what its politics are, and, and at this point I'm speculating, but it seems to me you can, uh, although the name is Union of the Radical Left, in fact it encompasses essentially all of the old support base of PASOK that hasn't been, of the, of the Social Democratic Party that hasn't, hasn't been totally compromised, uh, a bunch of, um, uh, a bunch of, uh, Completely unreconstructed leftists, still very much influenced by the history of you know, Greece's history and the and the civil war and so forth. Uh, all countries with any civil civil war in its past that tends to last a very long time in politics, and then uh, uh, also, and then a variety of other kind of rainbow social movements that that you would expect to, expect to see on the left. Uh, in terms of where this leads to, in terms of the position vis a vis the um, uh, vis a vis the uh, the. Uh, fight with the ECB and European Commission and, of course, um, uh, the German government. I think uh, there are roughly three positions that you can imagine. One is uh, to put up the best, best fight you can, but ultimately to capitulate regardless, uh, to accept whatever terms will be given. A second which would, as a last resort, accept, um, accept an exit from the, from the euro if the terms were sufficiently unacceptable. And a third, which positively welcomes uh, an exit from the euro and hopes that this will lead to uh, hopes that this will lead to bigger and better things, and perhaps also an exit from the European Union, although that makes less sense to me. So uh, that's I hasten to add. Yeah, I mean, there are names that are attached in the press to these various positions, but I don't know any more about about that than you do. What I want to do is look at this, look at this more general position, and then look at at, at further left movements, uh, Podemos in Spain. To some extent, the revival of the German left party, uh, Die Linke. Uh, what we're seeing, I think, is that, um, and more generally, of course, the failure of the mainstream social democratic parties to, cal to capitalise in any significant way on the disastrous failure of capitalism. They've almost all, in fact, been roped into the worst possible position, which is that of being the more sensible managers of the crisis, while the parties of the official right have been able to flirt very successfully with uh, xenophobic nationalism. Of course, who you know, in each country, the question of who the outsiders and insiders are is very different, but in each case, it's the foreigners who are to blame. Um, and, um, and so parties of this kind, uh, Le Pen, Golden Dawn in Greece, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, the National Front and so forth, um, uh, UKIP in the UK, uh, these parties have naturally tapped into very very understandable responses in the context of this crisis. Uh, the official Conservative parties have managed to play footsie with them and gain support, uh, while it's the, the Blairs and um, Passocks uh, who have taken the position of being the cautious people who always do the right thing and end up being obliterated at the polls, so losing neither, gaining neither any sort of uh, support from their previous support base nor the credit for doing, doing, doing the job of their opponents more successfully. Uh, how will this evolve? Well, this, I think, is, is a question I've laid out the positions. I think it's clear that there's, clear that there's uh, substantial potential support there and that a victory, as judged by, at least by Greek voters for Syriza, would be a great victory uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for the left in terms, of, in terms of at least putting forward a successful notion of resistance to the, um, uh, to the austerity-driven model of the crisis. Uh, what is still lacking, and, and you know, I think it's fair to say Syriza is basically just, oh yeah, basically just PASOK plus spine in general, socially, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I'll throw an observation that a remarkable number of, Ameri of young Americans are favourable to socialism, more as described in polls. Why? Well, on Fox News, what they see is that any politician in the Democratic Party who has any kind of spine is described as socialist, so from them, a socialist is just some, yeah, somebody who isn't a complete sellout. And, um, uh, and so in that sense, I think Syriza is doing its job. It isn't at this stage articulating any sort of comprehensive alternative. It's just saying, when, yeah, so far and no further, we will not take this. That, I think, is the first step, but uh, the task of, of articulating an appealing alternative to this failed model of capitalism, I think, still remains. So I'll stop there and we can have questions and discussion. Thanks.